So John Gruden, the now former head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders, resigned his position, which I think is absolutely the stupidest thing in the world. I have no idea why this man resigned. And just bear with me. Just bear with me. Here's why. So apparently, John Gruden, in an email, now, in an email, that means it was private, it was also sent, this, this email that we're talking about, or the series of emails, were sent from his private email address, so not his professional email address. He was um, using derogatory words about other people in these emails. Oh, I know, terrible. So the words that he was using, the F word, but not like the F F word, like the F word that has to do with gay people, that derogatory slur. He was using the P word, a misogynistic word, sure, a dirty word, not nice, don't like it, don't like when people use it. Ironically, though, I think he was using the P word about Roger Goodell, so a little a little lol to that, a little LOL to that. He used the word queer. He criticized um, NFL players who were kneeling. I guess he criticized Barack Obama. He criticized um, the agenda of certain NFL teams to specifically hire gay players because they're gay versus because they're good players. He criticized female refs, and he sent a picture of two cheerleaders. Ooh, <laughs> ooh, what a terrible crime this man has committed. What a terrible, terrible crime. Now listen, I, I like to think of myself as a pretty nice person. I don't typically hurl insults. I don't use derogatory words. I certainly don't use slurs. So don't get me wrong. I'm not condoning the use of any of these uh, words or how they were used. But I mean, there are offenses and there are offenses. Is this really the hill to die on, guys? Is this really, really that bad? I mean, again, private emails. These were personal emails from his personal address. And by the way, this was not yesterday or last week or last month or last year. This was a long time ago, like 10 years ago or something. A long time ago. He wasn't even a coach in the NFL at the time. He worked for ESPN or somewhere. I don't know the history of him because, you know, football. Um, a long time ago. And my response to this is all of these people who called for John Gruden to immediately resign because he used, in the words of the mainstream media, homophobic and misogynistic derogatory slurs, um, the NFL routinely hires horrible people. Like, that's, that's part of their culture, really. The NFL hires horrible people, and nobody says a word about it. Take Deshaun Watson, for example. How many women has he been accused of sexually assaulting? It's like 24 different women. He's playing right now in the NFL. No one called for his immediate resignation. And even if they did, no one paid attention to it and he's still playing. What about Tyreek Hill? He punched and choked his pregnant girlfriend. Like, is there anything that makes a man a more terrible man than punching and choking your pregnant girlfriend? He's still being paid by the NFL. No one has forced him to resign. But if you said the P word about Roger Goodell in a private email a decade ago, then by gosh, you should resign immediately. The NFL doesn't have actual problems. They are inventing a problem because they don't know what actual problems are. They do not know what actual problems are. Here's the other thing. If every single person in the NFL who has ever said the P word or the F word or anything derogatory or rude or mean or anything in an email or a text message, a private email or a private text message, anybody in the NFL or everybody in the NFL who's ever said that wasn't allowed to be in the NFL, there would not be an NFL. So what we're seeing right now is cancel culture. We're seeing cancel culture. John Gruden has been canceled. He's literally lost his career over this. Like, can you wrap your mind around that for a second? Because he sent a picture of two cheerleaders. Because he criticized female refs. Because he disagreed with the agenda to hire gay players for being gay. Because he criticized Barack Obama and criticized kneeling. And oh, oh, wait just a second. That's probably what this is about. This isn't really about the P word, is it? It's not even really about the F word, is it? No. No, no. This is because John Gruden didn't fall in line with a radical leftist ideology. He didn't toe the line. He didn't want to be, he didn't, he wanted to be about football. He didn't want to be about wokeness and radical leftist ideology. And so the radical left wants to cancel him. Here's what I don't get. Why did he resign? When you are the subject of the pylon, when you are the subject of the cancel mob, do not back down. Do not resign. Sure, if you feel that you must, you can apologize for saying those words. You can. And then refuse to resign. Because what are we in our country if we can't have forgiveness for past transgressions? Especially transgressions, which are arguably, like, not that big of a deal compared to punching and choking your pregnant girlfriend or sexually assaulting 24 women. Like, is there anyone among us who hasn't said a mean thing? Anyone among us? 
Who is without sin? No. So should none of us be able to work? None of us be able to have a career? Should we all resign for our jobs if we've committed one sin in our past? That's not the kind of country that I want to live in. It's the most ridiculous story. The NFL trying to be woke is the most ridiculous thing that has happened this entire past decade. Um, on, a, on a very, very serious note, however, the shipping container traffic jam that's happening off the coast of LA, this is a really, really big deal. In fact, this should be headlining across the country because it has very serious ramifications that every single American in our country will feel. We're gonna talk about that in just a second. I'm Liz Wheeler, welcome to The Liz Wheeler Show. The shipping container traffic jam off the coast of LA, I don't know if anybody watching has taken off uh, out of LAX recently, but if you take off out of LAX, you look down in the water around you and there are ships dotting everywhere, dozens and dozens and dozens of ships with millions of shipping containers. They're unable to reach the ports. They're not able to deliver their goods. They're just in this horrendous traffic jam, which um, is already but he's going to, in the very near future, have very serious repercussions for us all. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But first, I want to talk to you about Ned. Ned is one of Spencer Clavin's favorite products. Ned, he uses for muscle soreness and inflammation, and he swears by it. So what is Ned, you might ask? Ned is your approachable CBD product. CBD helps you combat you know, stress, sleep, pain, anxiety, inflammation issues that you might have. The CBD market has become extremely saturated over the past few years. It seems like you can now buy CBD in almost every coffee shop or grocery store. And many of these CBD companies out there source their hemp from industrial farms in China, which is a no-no. But all of Ned's full-spectrum hemp oil is extracted from USDA-certified organic hemp plants grown by an independent farmer in Colorado. So you don't have to have the same worries that you would have about foreign-grown hemp. So today I want to introduce you to Ned's brand new product, which has been in development for over a year. It's called the De-Stress Blend. This formula is made from the world's purest full-spectrum hemp and features a botanical infusion of ashwagandha, cardamom, and cinnamon. If you want to try the new De-Stress Blend from Ned, a brand that we love and we trust, we have a special offer for the Liz Wheeler Show audience. Every order over $40 qualifies for 15% off plus a free De-Stress Blend sample. So go to helloned.com slash Liz or enter Liz at checkout to take advantage of this offer. That's helloned.com slash Liz to get 15% off plus a free de-stress blend sample on any order over 40. I think you'll like it. Go ahead and try it out. Spencer, I swear, swears by it. Okay, so I was having a conversation with my dad um, the other weekend, and my dad was predicting. He was saying that there's going to be food shortages across the country within the year, maybe even over the winter. And to be honest, I was scoffing at the claim a little bit. You know, I was thinking a little bit like, oh, boomer, food shortages, prepper, you know, like, let's not be ridiculous here. Um, and the reason I'm telling this story is because I think he may have been right and I think my scoffing may have been wrong. And here's why. I will admit when I'm wrong. Here's why. The shipping container traffic jam is a very big deal. This is a bigger deal than just Kamala Harris telling us a couple months ago, there may not be enough toys on the shelves at Christmas. Yes, for a materialistic society such as ours, that's a big deal, of course. Um, but it's actually a lot bigger deal than that. So what is actually happening? We've, we've, I think we've all heard these vague headlines, maybe even seen the photos, but what is happening? Well, what is happening is 70 container ships are waiting off of Long Beach and off of LA, waiting for entry to the port to deliver all their goods. Now, keep in mind that 90% of global trade is shipped by sea, 70% of which is shipped in these shipping containers. And just for a little context here, each ship is big enough to hold in these shipping containers one and a half million dishwashers. This is um, a mathematical calculation that came via Yahoo. So that's each of these ships. There are 70 ships off LA and Long Beach right now, each could hold a million and a half dishwashers. Obviously, they bring products other than kitchen appliances. But just to give a context of how absolutely enormous and how much product they carry and how critical this is to the United States economy. So why is this backup happening? Why, why, why are we seeing this traffic jam? So the reason that we're seeing this is because we have very serious issues in our supply chain. These issues actually predate COVID. They predate Biden. But they are being exacerbated by COVID and by Biden. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. But the reason that the supply chain was already so brittle was because of what's called lean inventories. Lean inventories, and I did a deep dive into this this weekend just to kind of condense it um, all so that it makes sense to us all so that we know what Biden needs to do because what he needs to do is not what he's doing. 
But lean inventories means that suppliers here in the United States, say a sofa store or something, orders just enough inventory, just enough sofas to meet their demand. They order no extra. So if they happen to get any extra demand, then they have to immediately put in new orders instead of just having a little buffer or a little um, room. So because of lean inventories, we already had this sort of brittle supply chain that any disruption in that chain would cause um, a lack of supply for a moment. And you know when there's a lack of supply that increases demand and it throws off um, the balance of our economy. So enter COVID, right? We already had predating COVID. We had this, this brittle supply chain because of lean inventories. And then when COVID came, workers in the factories in China were put off work. They were put off work for a couple of reasons. They were put off because of quarantines. They were put off um, they were put off for many reasons. Production went down ultimately. And when production goes down, supply goes down. When supply goes down, demand generally goes up. You remember your basic economics. Um, demand, however, because of COVID in the United States, it temporarily went down, which actually exacerbated the production problem in China because when demand goes down, well, then you don't have enough work for the workers. So some of them were actually laid off during that temporary dip. But then demand went way up. Consumers in the United States started ordering stuff like crazy when we were stuck in our homes, um, when things were closed down, when stores were closed down in the past year and a half. Demand went way up. But the factories in China that create that product that they're going to ship to the United States, they didn't have workers because they'd been laid off because the demand temporarily dipped during the initial part of the lockdowns here in the United States. As you can see, let me cut into my little tutorial for a second. As you can see, the lockdowns that the politicians force on us, the repercussions, the unintended consequences of these things are absolutely horrendous. Not only is there a huge healthcare crisis as a result of these lockdowns, this is predating the vaccine mandate healthcare crisis, by the way. I'm talking the healthcare crisis where elective surgeries were um, delayed or canceled, where people weren't able to see their routine, get routine checkups or screenings and missed treatments. They were delayed which is going to cause people to die, miss diagnosis that wouldn't have been fatal if they'd gotten the diagnosis on time, but because of the delayed diagnosis, now they probably will be fatal. These lockdowns had horrible repercussions. And another one of these repercussions, which until now hasn't been discussed, is the fact that it, it, it meddled with the market. It meddled with supply and demand. When you meddle with supply and demand, it has a ripple effect. This is one of the ripple effects on an already brittle supply chain. So in addition to what was happening in China, here in the United States, there were less, there were fewer workers working in shipyards. There were fewer truck drivers, right? Because, again, why? Why were there fewer workers in shipyards? Why were there fewer truck drivers? Well, there were fewer workers in shipyards because there were COVID policies enforced by politicians that were shutting down entire ports over a single COVID case. One COVID case shut down the port. Well, if the port shut down, then you can't deliver the goods to the port from the ships. There were fewer truck drivers to disseminate all of these goods. Why? Because politicians imposed enormous unemployment benefits that made it more advantageous for people not to work, get paid more for not working than work. They were paid less to work. So politicians meddled in this already brittle crisis. Meanwhile, the containers themselves, there has become a shortage of the actual containers because they're all caught on ships. And the containers themselves are manufactured in China. So then the vicious cycle continues because in China, you then didn't have the workers in the factories because they were laid off because of financial reasons, because of a dip in demand, because of policies implemented here in the United States that impacted the consumer. And it's become this whole toxic mess. And now we start seeing the backup off, off the shores of California. So then we have the question, is this Joe Biden's fault? Is this the fault of deliberate choices made by Joe Biden and his administration? And of course, the answer to this is nuanced. It's not black and white. It's always in the gray area. So the answer to the question, is this Joe Biden's fault, which many are making the accusation that it is, the answer to that is actually yes and no. So let's start with no. The part of this that is not Biden's fault is that we had pre-existing issues with the supply chain, meaning we, we were already too reliant on China. We already outsourced too many of... Um, too much of our manufacturing, too many factories are in China versus in the United States, too many companies outsource their labor to China because it's cheaper. So we already had this pre-existing reliance on China, which, I mean, I've warned about this for a long time. Other conservatives have warned about this for a long time. Um, Trump actually warned about this a lot and did something about it. We'll get to that in a moment. But 
we were already too reliant on China. It was only a matter of time until it was going to become a problem. So that part is not specifically Biden's fault. But the part that is Biden's fault, that should be blamed on Biden, that Biden should be held accountable for, is the COVID policies across the country that his administration has encouraged. His administration's um, bureaucrats like Fauci have essentially dictated that have made this so much worse. So what I mean is what would normally happen in a situation like this where demand increased is more shipping companies and more truck drivers would enter the market to meet the market demands. But because of Joe Biden's choices, the COVID unemployment that made it more advantageous not to work than to work, the truck drivers didn't enter the market. Shipping companies didn't start competing for the business. Biden's policies made what would normally happen, this sort of balancing act that happens in a free market, made that not happen. So Biden is 100% responsible for that, especially because conservatives have warned him about the far-reaching ramifications of this horrible COVID unemployment policy where people are paid more to not work than they are paid to work. I mean, that's why everywhere we go, right? In your, in your hometown, I'm sure, there's hiring looking for employment signs. We're hiring signs everywhere because no one can find employees because everyone is paid more to not work than they are if they actually work. Biden is, of course, to blame for that. And so the market can't operate properly if the market is meddled with the way that Biden is meddling with it. And so, yes, it is his, it is his problem. Now, the repercussions of this are way more serious than Kamala Harris claiming that no toys will be on the shelves at Christmas. Yeah, that's that's annoying for parents. That's annoying for consumers. But this has very serious repercussions as well. This has national security repercussions. And what I mean by that is the U.S. military re re relies on a supply chain that they don't actually know where the original source is. Now, what I mean by that, I'm going to use a concrete example here, not a hypothetical example. The Columbia submarine of the United States Navy it has 5,000 suppliers who provide the parts for the submarine. 5,000. And they're sourced from all over the world. Now, we need a certain amount of these submarines before the year 2028 in order to keep our strategic advantage against adversarial countries. But when the United States Navy doesn't know how much their supply chain relies on foreign production, which means they don't know how much disruptions in the supply chain will disrupt their ability to source the parts, the 5,000 parts that they need from all around the world in order to build these submarines, which we need for our strategic advantage, this becomes a security risk. What if we don't get the parts in time? What if the military doesn't know how to source from anywhere else? What if we don't get this built by 2028? What if we lose our strategic advantage? Will the American people be at literal physical risk? This has never before happened in the U.S. military, where the military doesn't know how much or how little their supply chain relies on foreign production. Therefore, we don't know if these shipping container traffic jams, this disruption of supply and demand from China, whether this will impact the security of our nation. That's just one example of myriads of examples. I mean, our supply chain is brittle. Our supply chain is reliant on foreign powers. This is dangerous. It's dangerous at an incredible level. And Joe Biden, that's Joe Biden's fault too, because Joe Biden is the commander in chief of the United States military. The buck stops with him. He said so himself. He has a responsibility to keep our nation safe. And he's instead endangering our country. So what are we going to see in the next couple of months as a result of this? Well, we're going to see a shortage of fruit in the winter, it looks like. Again, I will, mea culpa, I will admit when I was wrong that my dad appears to be correct. He said that there were going to be food shortages this winter. I scoffed at him. Well, maybe not. If this continues, if this is not corrected, it looks like imports that have come through our ports, including fruit, including cars, plasma TVs, I don't even know what else, supplies for submarines that are necessary for our nation's national security, there's going to be a shortage. Our supply chain is at risk, partially due to our reliance on China. Again, that's also Biden's fault. Because as the commander-in-chief, as the president, you should realize that reliance on China, who wants to overtake the United States as the world's superpower, is dangerous. It's stupid. So what can we do? 
This, by the way, is what the Trump administration was trying to fix with China. They were trying to make sure that the United States was in the power seat when it came to trade with China so that China couldn't use anything, use trade, use our supply chain as a weapon against us. Trump was very smart enough to know that the strongest weapon that we can use right now against China is our economy. And he was doing that. That is what Biden is undoing. So we can stop our reliance on foreign nations. We can make sure that America is first economically. And again, maybe my dad was right about food shortages. Also, also, where is Mayor Pete Buttigieg? Mr. Secretary of Transfer Transportation Pete? Shouldn't he be involved in something as serious as this? Well, when Mayor Pete was asked, Secretary Pete was asked, he said, obviously it's an incredibly complicated situation. Yeah, Secretary Pete, it is, but it also isn't. He said his department was taking the problem seriously and holding round tables. Round tables? Really? That's what you're doing? When our supply chain is at risk, you're holding round tables? I think this is what happens when your helmet is too tight on your bike ride to work, or should I say your bike ride from the curb to your office to make it look like that you care about the environment and don't drive a car. A car, by the way, an SUV, which transported your bicycle up until the last block before you got to work. Secretary Pete is an absolute joke, but one of the things that you and I can do is we can make sure that these people do not hold office. We can vote them out of office because they are a danger to our country, a literal danger. Our national security is at risk because the Biden administration is in office, so vote them out. Now, I know what a lot of you are gonna say. Okay, well, we use the ballot box, but how do we have confidence in the power of our vote when we see that the integrity of our elections is in question, and that's putting it nicely? But first, I want to talk to you about Lucy. Lucy Nicotine is a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. Finally, tobacco alternatives that don't suck. Researched and developed for three years to be made for people, not patients. Lucy has created a nicotine gum with four milligrams of nicotine. They've also created a lozenge with four milligrams of nicotine. Um, these gums and lozenges are FSA and HSA eligible, so you can use your FSA cards to purchase Lucy now, and it's convenient and discreet. Products can be enjoyed anywhere, on flights, at work, on the go, or even at the gym. It's 2021. Get rid of your cigarettes, unplug your vape, throw away your dip, and get some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each month. It's so simple, and you don't have to leave your house because Lucy has delivery down. Liz Wheeler Show listeners, go to lucy.co and use promo code Liz to get 20% off all products on your first order, including gums or lozenges. That's lucy.co and use promo code Liz at checkout. Also, I have to give this disclaimer. Warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. But remember, lucy.co and be sure to use that promo code Liz for 20% off. You'll be glad you did. Okay. So if we need to vote the Biden administration, all these radical leftists who are completely ignoring this supply chain issue, which puts the national security of our country at risk, if we need to vote these people out of office, okay, I think we all accept that, but how do we ensure election integrity? How do we ensure that our votes count? What do we actually do to make sure, besides just talking about it, besides just reporting on it, what do we do at the legislative level to ensure election integrity? And so I think that's a question that we should explore, and all Republicans, all conservatives, don't even really have to be conservative, honestly. Anybody who believes in the integrity of a vote um, should want to protect the integrity of that vote. And here's what we need to do. First of all, we need voter ID. Because with voter ID, you're protecting against the vulnerability of fraud. It's not racist. It doesn't disproportionately impact black people. Minorities aren't stifled from their right to vote. Those are all liberal lies. We've debunked, debunked those a million times. We need voter ID. We need to ban ballot harvesting. This is such a no-brainer. It's so ridiculous. I mean, who on earth would think that it is not a vulnerability to fraud to have a random stranger come to your door, take your filled out mail-in ballot back to the voting booth for you with no, nothing, no eyeballs on it in between? Like, are you joking? Of course that's a vulnerability. Voter ID we need, banning ballot, harv we need ballot harvesting. We need to ban universal mail-in ballots. Yes, absentee ballots are fine, but you should have to have a reason you should have to request the absentee ballots, and you should have to have your signature verified. Otherwise, who knows who's going to get their hands on your ballot? There's no verification. We should also ban early voting. This, I know, is not necessarily a popular position, even among some conservatives, but hear me out. I have a good reason for this. Early voting is a disservice to voters because a lot of 
the campaign information comes out at the last second. Take 2016, for example. James Comey, all of that stuff with Hillary Clinton, that was the last two weeks prior to the election. The Google searches for how do I change my early vote away from Hillary Clinton skyrocketed after the James Comey stuff. But people who had cast their ballots early in most states did not have the opportunity to reconsider their vote. Their vote was already counted. You do not have all of the information. It's a disservice to voters to vote early. We should not allow it. We should also ban 24-hour um, non-observed drop boxes because non-observed drop boxes can be tampered with. They absolutely can be tampered with. Make no mistake. We should require transparent ballot chain of ownership, meaning we should know at any given moment who had responsibility for ballots that have already been filled out. There should be no blank spaces, no blackout points. We should know on any given minute who has ownership of ballots that have already been cast. We should also audit our elections. So auditing elections should not be controversial. We audit businesses all the time, audit corporations. This is a normal thing to make sure that everything's functioning correctly, that there's no vulnerabilities, that there's no fraud, that there's no mismanagement. We should audit elections to make sure that we understand what the vulnerabilities are so that we can fix them for the next time. And it shouldn't be controversial. We should eliminate ballots whose signatures don't match the registration. I can't even believe I need to say this one. This one is such a no-brainer. If your voter registration signature does not match the signature on your ballot, there should at least, they should at least check with you to see why that is that the signatures don't match, but they shouldn't just let that vote be cast. It could be fraudulent. We also shouldn't allow motor voter laws. Motor voter laws, there's a law like this in California, for example, where anytime that you get a driver's license, you are automatically registered to vote. That is a huge vulnerability to fraud because not everyone who gets a driver's license is eligible to vote. And you have to self-identify on your motor voter or on your driver's license registration if you are not eligible. So if you're not eligible and you don't check off the box that says I am ineligible, you're registered to vote, even though you're not allowed to vote by law. We need to get rid of that. We also need to uh, disallow same-day voter registration. This makes it very difficult for the staffing to be correct at polls if you don't know how many voters you expect to come in. Um, and in busier areas, busier precincts, this can be a big deal. This can lead to wait times. This can lead to um, lack of basically the process, the, uh, the organization of the polling precinct isn't as well rung if they are overwhelmed, and that can lead to vulnerabilities and fraud. We also need to allow poll watchers full access to watch the proceedings um, without being blocked, without being kicked out, because they're there to protect our votes. There should be people on both sides of the aisle, Democrat and Republican. They're partisan. Poll watchers are. They should protect everyone's vote. We also, and this again should be a no-brainer, we should make sure to prohibit illegal aliens from voting, even locally. This is the Democrats' new strategy. Is they want illegal aliens, foreign nationals, to be allowed to vote in municipal elections or school board elections. Absolutely not, unless you're a citizen of this country and otherwise eligible. We also must clean up voter rolls. There are dead people, people that moved. It makes it very difficult to see if someone is an eligible voter, whether they intend to commit fraud or not, if we are not routinely cleaning up voter rolls, making sure that only eligible people are on those rolls. We also need to make sure to keep the federal government out of state elections. Our constitution stipulates that it's not the federal government's role to run elections. It is the state's right to run elections. The Democrats, of course, with their HR1, want the federal government to be able to dictate rules that states must follow that would invalidate the laws that states themselves have determined are appropriate for elections in, in their state. We must keep the federal government out of the state. And finally, we must eliminate the ballots of voters who moved counties. I know that many of these people may not have intended to commit fraud. Don't even call it fraud if you don't want. Just call it an ineligible ballot. There are ineligible ballots that are counted because there's not the intent of fraud behind it, and that's wrong. If you are not eligible to vote in a specific precinct in a specific county because you have moved, I'm sorry, you don't get to vote. Vote where you're eligible. Vote where you're eligible. If we do these things, if as conservatives we push for these things, we don't allow Democrats to label us as, you know, racists or voter suppressors or whatever their whatever their accusations of the day it are. If we stand by these provisions, we will actually have confidence that we can hold our government accountable with our vote. Our vote is very powerful. We must protect it. Okay.
there's no there's no good segue into into this next topic. There's no easy segue. Superman is gay now, apparently. Bisexual. Gay now is going to be uh, kissing another man. We're going to talk about that in just a second. I know, aren't you so excited to hear the details of this? Um, we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But first, I want to talk to you about restricted. The question is, should big tech have the power to control what we see and what we hear? And if they do control what we see and hear, don't they control what we think? Now, you know my feelings on this. I've been shut down repeatedly by big tech, consistently demonetized on Facebook. I often have to self-censor my shows on YouTube so that YouTube doesn't delete my channel. But big tech tyranny is not just a conservative issue. It should not be a partisan issue at all. My friends at PragerU just released a new documentary called Restricted. It's a fantastic deep dive into why big tech censorship is a problem that affects all of us. Now, you can watch the new film right now at PragerU.com slash Restricted. They talk to comedian J.P. Sears. They talk to Facebook employees, locals founder Dave Rubin, policy experts, all people who are intimately familiar with the inner workings of big tech, how we got to this point and what we can or can't do to stop this tyrannical restriction of our free speech. I encourage you, watch this documentary with your family and your friends, pregeru.com slash restricted. It is so important that we are all educated on this issue and what we can do to fight back. Again, that's pregeru.com slash restricted. Go check it out today. And also bonus, guess who directed this? That's right, the great and powerful Jay Hay did. pregeru.com slash restricted. Check it out. Okay, apparently Superman is gay. America's man, Superman. So I'm not, I have to admit, I I don't really follow comic books that closely. I mostly follow them when they make a political statement like this. So apparently this isn't like Superman, Superman, the original. This is Superman's son, John Kent, who is taking over the mantle of Superman because, I don't know, maybe Superman isn't so super anymore. I don't know. I don't know why he is. But anyway, John Kent, the new Superman, Um, is coming out as bisexual. He is going to kiss a man. And listen, let me just preface this by saying, we are fortunate to live in a country, the United States of America, where every person can decide to live how they so choose, right? That you can commit yourself to another person for life, that you can love another person, that you can kiss another person regardless of their gender, that or gender, that's, that's your choice. And we're lucky to live in a nation where if you're gay, you're not thrown off a building. You're not imprisoned. You're not, you know, even socially ostracized. We are fortunate to live in that country. I'm Catholic, a practicing Catholic, and my views on same-sex marriage are in line with the views of the Catholic Church because I'm a devout Catholic. But here's what I would say. I think that this is the stupidest thing in the world to make Superman gay. The absolute stupidest thing in the world. Because what this is, let's, let's, let's recognize what this is. This isn't tolerance. This isn't inclusion. This isn't representation. No. What this is, is this is an attack on masculinity. I'm not even going to say traditional masculinity because that implies that masculinity has morphed. No, this is an attack on what it means to be a man. What it means to be a man. And this is something, what it means to be a man is something that transcends culture. It's something that transcends time, just like Superman. It is something that is innate to human nature. Masculinity, what it means to be a man. And the woke left wants to erase what it means to be a man. They want to feminize men. They want to erase masculinity. They have a phrase for it. They call it toxic masculinity. So here's my question. Why can't we admire strength? That's part of what it means to be a man. Why can't men protect women? That's also part of what it means to be a man. Why can't muscles and heroics appeal to the masses? Why can't we make, even if it's a fictional hero, why can't we make a fictional hero of a straight white man? Like I said, this is wokeness. It's not tolerance. It's not inclusion. It's not a celebration that we have equal rights under the law for actual non-comic book gay people in our country, all of which are a good thing. No, this is wokeness because the left cannot have a straight white man be a hero. It ruins their narrative that all straight white men are inherently racist, inherently sexist, inherently misogynistic oppressors in the patriarchy. That is why Superman is now going to be gay or Superman's son is bisexual if you want to be nuanced. Superman, the comic book series, has become extremely woke, and this is not, this is not speculation on my part. This, this new Superman has combated wildfires caused by climate change. He's stopped a school shooting. He's protested the deportation of refugees. I mean, this is obviously Hollywood using entertainment to try to indoctrinate people, using wokeness to try to purport their political agenda. So Superman being gay is stupid, and that's why. That is why. And this... this attack on gender, this attack on traditional femininity and traditional masculinity, this is not just Superman. This is not, 
you know, just this comic book. This is corporate wokeism is also on board with this. So the brand Legos, which I loved as a child, by the way, as a girl, I loved them as a child. But let me tell you something. I liked the pink ones better. I liked the ones where you could build a dream house better than I liked the ones where you could, you know, build an airplane, build, be an electrical engineer or whatever it is that the boy toys did. I liked Legos, but Legos now says that they will not have girls and boys versions of their toy. They're going to make them gender neutral. Why? Why is it bad if a girl like me liked to build a house out of Legos versus a boy who liked to build, you know, a stealth fighter? Why is that a bad thing? Why are we trying to erase gender? Didn't make me any less successful, less intelligent. It's because the left must attack gender. And we'll talk about why in just a second, because Governor Newsom in California, he's doing this too. He is jumping on this bandwagon. He has now banned girls and boys toy aisles in big box retailers. He's mandating a gender neutral section. Why? Why? This is actually a very important question. Why? The answer is because Marxists must destroy the family. They must destroy the family. And they do so by destroying marriage and by destroying gender and by destroying sex. Because they can't destroy the family unless they've destroyed gender. They can't destroy the family unless they've destroyed sex. And so they're attacking children. They're taking this to children. They're indoctrinating with comic books. They're trying to make Legos gender neutral. They're refusing to have a girl's toys and a boy's toys aisle. Like, it's just simple organization. Your young boy child is probably not going to be interested in, you know, a frilly pink doll. Your little girl is probably more likely to be interested in that frilly pink doll than she is to be interested in, I don't know, a robot or a dinosaur. And that's okay. That's okay. In fact, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to recognize the difference between women and between men, between boys and between girls, between femininity and masculinity, and it should be treasured and it should be protected. And again, that's why it's stupid that Superman is gay, because it's not about tolerance, not about inclusion, it's not about representation. It is an active part of the Marxist tactic, the Marxist strategy to take down traditional marriage, because they know that marriage and the family are the best bulwark against Marxism. Without the family, Marxism comes easy. Marxism comes very easy. So it's kind of a heavy topic to think about this, to think that we are being bombarded from every side um, by Marxists and their plots, their strategies. And so I had a viewer write into me and ask me this week, how do we stay happy and positive? How do I stay happy and positive when the world around us is burning? And this is what I responded. I said, first of all, read your Bible and go to mass. Find your joy in Christ, not in the world. Because if you do find your joy in Christ, your external circumstances won't change that joy in your heart, that joy of Christ in your heart. So I know that that's maybe easier said than done, but it's also helped me tremendously. Read your Bible, go to Mass, find joy in Christ, and then your external circumstances won't change the joy in your heart. Also, in a practical sense, put down the smartphone sometimes and stop reading um, push notifications from the news 24-7. Set aside times of the day where you don't have your phone or set aside times of the day where that's the only time you read news. Make friends with people who do things. Do things other than just talk politics. Friends who do something fun. Go golfing. Plant a garden. Go to the beach. Grill a steak. Play Monopoly have another baby. Do things that aren't intimately tied all the time to political narratives. And if you do those things, you will have a well-balanced life. You will, feel, um, you will feel energized to fight against Marxism, to fight against communism, to fight against the devil, to fight against the radical left. And you won't just feel discouraged because you will also have this family life, this activity life, this life in Christ to step back to. And that's the best advice that I have. That's the best advice that I have, how to stay happy when the world is on fire. We are called to find joy in Christ regardless of our external circumstances, and we certainly should strive to make the best effort to do so. If you haven't already, um, my interview with Senator Ted Cruz where he talks about the border crisis is live on Locals at LizWheelerShow.com slash Locals. It was a great interview. Um, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it, so take a listen to it and then comment underneath it. Let me know what you think. We are out of time for today, according to the great and powerful Jay Hay. So think for yourself. Use critical thought. Question authority. Follow the facts. Don't let government or corporate wokeism or anybody bully you into being a sheep. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star rating. Write us a glowing review. 
Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. The Liz Wheeler Show is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Chad Abbott. Director of photography, Kevin McRoberts. Editor, Alejandro Figuerilla. Assistant editor, Michael Wall. Sound mixer, Robin Fenderson. Post-production manager, Victoria Metzel. Director of marketing, Emily Washler. Production and talent coordinator, Matt Toffler. And senior publicist, Patricia Jackson. This has been a Soundfront production. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.